Very excited to serve in that capacity. We uh, have a very exciting project coming up, as you know, which is the Downtown Improvements Project. And as a part of that, um, we asked for a market study to be conducted to be able to assist um, individuals who are looking to invest in the downtown as well as businesses that are already existing there as to what opportunities they might have for uh, future retail development in the downtown. Um, before I get started on introducing uh, our guest tonight, I do want to recognize some folks. Um, we've got uh, Mayor Ben Nelson right over here. Hello. Yes, Janet Martin, council member. <laughs> council member Bill Longcart, right there. I should have known he'd be in the front row. Okay, <laughs> council member Mike Gibson. Uh, Stephen McIntosh, and he's in the back row, okay? All right. Uh, we are also pleased to have this evening uh, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry, Stephen Slackta. <laughs> District 3, council member. All right, fine. All right, there goes that evaluation. Anyway, uh, we also have with us tonight uh, Mr. Roger Desjardins, who is our county manager. Roger's right there in the back. And I just want to take this time uh, to thank the Bonita Springs Fire and Rescue Group for allowing us to use their building for meetings like this. It's very important, so we thank them as well. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our guest speaker. Um, obviously, our downtown is a very important project to us, and there's a certain vision that we're trying to reach there. Um, and, and there was some controversy in getting to an approval on this. Um, but now that we're past the decision-making process, and construction is probably going to start within the next four weeks. Uh, we wanted to take a look at what the retail opportunities were downtown, what's likely to be attracted down there, um, and, and what, again, existing businesses or future investors might be able to look forward to. So tonight, without further more to do, I want to introduce to you Mr. Bob Gibbs. Uh, Bob is president of Gibbs Planning Group uh, and is a pioneering member of the Congress of New Urbanism. Uh, he is considered a leading urban retail planning consultant by some of the most respected mayors, architects, and real estate developers in this country. He has consulted on more than 500 public and private town centers around the world. Uh, Mr. Gibbs is a frequent public speaker and teaches the course Retail Planning and Design Principles for Harvard University's Executive Education Program. Without further ado, I'd like you to welcome Bob Gibbs. Thank you, good evening, and thank you for inviting me to present tonight and to d complete this study. Um, our task was to estimate the amounts and types of retail that are supportable in your historic village today and for the next five years. And in order to do this, uh, we've analyzed the uh, lifestyles, the incomes, the uh, employment, of your residents, your visitors, your employees, students, and I'll talk a minute about how we did that. We've done a lot of work in this in Florida uh, for the last five years. Half of our work has been in Florida. We're currently working in Longwood and in Winter Park, Florida. We did this same study we're doing for you. We did this same study 20 years ago for Naples, Florida, back when it was a sleepy little Fifth Avenue and Third Street. We did it and we updated it five years ago for Fifth Avenue. Last year we finished a study for Sarasota. We studied five areas of Sarasota. And uh, so we get to work in Florida all the time, which I really appreciate. Tomorrow I'm going up to Seaside. Uh, we've been consulting with Seaside for about 25 years and Rosemary and the new urban communities. We uh, found that, can, can, if you could dim those two lights, that would be really nice. Thank you. We found that uh, today that you can support about 135,000 square feet of additional space above and beyond what's there right now, and that today you could generate about $43 million in additional retail sales. And that includes 14,000 square feet of limited service restaurants, 11,000 square feet of apparel and clothing and shoes, 
uh, 12,000 square feet of department store type goods. Those are home appliances and cosmetics and things you can buy in department stores. We found that you can support really two to three full service restaurants equating to 9,000 feet. You can support about 20,000 uh, feet of what's known as general merchandise. And there's room for your groceries. You have a nice small market right now. There's room for that market to expand or for another a market to come in equating to about 20,000 square feet. To put that in perspective, a Trader Joe's is about 15 to 18,000 square feet and a Whole Foods is about 30 to 40,000 square feet. Uh, this is how it breaks down just with a simple bar chart. We were very uh, pleasantly surprised to find such a strong demand for uh, general retail stores and restaurants, uh, both limited service and full service restaurants. By 2020, the sales will increase to about $50 million a year. That's in addition to what's there right now and uh, or about 144,000 square feet of additional space. We estimate that right, right now there's only about 30 to 40,000 square feet of space. So it's very conceivable that you could more than uh, by fourfold uh, increase by four times the amount of retail and restaurants that you have right now in the village. Uh, this is just a little uh, diagram of the city and uh, showing you where you're located within a 15 mile radius. This is, of course, the historic village, our study area. You know, it's on old 41. 41 used to go through there. That's why it was originally established as a village, and then it was bypassed later on with the modern Tamiami Highway 41. The uh, downtown area, I'm going to call it the downtown area, uh, is surrounded by very strong demographics. Uh, they're less strong cl the closer you get to the village, but the market as a whole has very strong demographics. And there's a number of very, uh, very encouraging and strong mark businesses in the downtown area. What we've noticed, though, is that these businesses are what we call purpose-driven businesses, where people are getting in their car and they're driving to go to a restaurant or to a shop, and that your downtown isn't functioning yet as a district. There are very few people that are saying, let's get in the car and drive to the historic district and park the car and walk around for two to three hours. That's just not happening. And so unfortunately, every business that's there, every restaurant that's there has to do promotion and advertising to get people just to go to their one business. Now, we believe that once you finish your new streetscape improvements and once uh, other things are going to happen here, that it's more likely that you be, will become more of a destination and more of a district where people will say, let's go there and let's walk around for an hour. And we don't know what restaurant we're going to go to, but we're just going to go there and look and see. And then we'll pick it out once we get there. As a part of our study, we visited every shopping center and almost every store within about a 10-mile radius of the study area. Uh, I, was the, I, I did a similar study for a Coconut Point for the Simon property about 10 or 15 years ago, and uh, I'm very familiar, or I was very familiar then with your market and your conditions. But we literally went through every shopping center and almost every store in your market. I'm very familiar with the Mercado. I'm very familiar with, uh, with the shoulder markets that you have. Uh, we did a study for Fort Myers about 15 years ago. We established what we call a primary and secondary trade area. This is the boundary of what we call the primary trade area, and this is where we think roughly 55% of the potential customers will live that will come um, into the downtown area and the shop. It's a fairly conservative radius. Uh, this is to put it in scale, that's a four mile radius. So roughly within about four to five miles, we think about 55% of the potential customers will live. The purple is what we call the total trade area. That's where we think uh, the balance of about 70 to 80% of the people will live that'll come to shop in the downtown area. And in your case, we established something that we call the near neighborhood trade area, 
We very seldom do that, but that's a very tight location where we think I think a lot of these people will come and, and go here for a convenience. The demographics uh, show that in the near neighborhood area, there's about 21,000 people. The primary trade area, about 70,000 people. And the total trade area of about a quarter of a million. This is a very dense, a very, very strong market. To put this in perspective, the average retailer that we work with when we do site selection for retailers, they want to have 50,000 people. And so you're well in excess of the minimum that most retailers are looking for. There's about uh, 32,000 households in the primary trade area, 112,000 households in the total trade area, and very strong incomes. In the near neighborhood, you have a $72,000 income. That's compared to the state. You're slightly below the state's average. But in the primary and in the total trade area, you have very high incomes of well over $100,000 per year. The average retailer that we're looking for is looking for household incomes averaging $65,000 or more. So even for the near neighborhood area, which is lower than the states, you're still exceeding the site selection criteria for many of the retailers that we have. Now, in order to do our research, we spy on you. We actually buy data from companies that uh, sells us your credit card usage. And so we, we have records of where the people in the neighborhood, the primary and the total area, we know where they charge, what things they buy. We, buy, uh, we bought data from a company that, re that uh, spies on where you search on the internet. So we know what kinds of sites people go to on the internet. We know what kinds of magazines people read. We know what kind of cars they buy. We know what kind of places you go on vacation. And we compile all of that into what's known as a tapestry lifestyle. And then we correspond your tapestry lifestyle with the site selection criteria for various retailers that we're aware of. The largest tapestry that we had, 36% of you, are classified as the silver and gold uh, lifestyle. And uh, they, these individuals have healthier lifestyles. They maintain a regular exercise. They have healthy eating habits. They prefer luxury cars or SUVs. Uh, they buy a lot of convertibles. They're avid readers. And they're big supporters of charitable organizations. The second largest group is known as the uh, uh, senior escapees. And these people, uh, they're, they have, they're restricted by income. They don't carry balances on their credit cards. Uh, they watch TV that's popular. They own three TVs on average. They like to eat out. They eat out at places like Crackle Barrel, Golden Corral, and Denny's. And so we, bought, we classified you, and this will be in our study, but we classified you into about 20 subcategories of your population. We're just not looking at your income. We're looking at the kinds of businesses that you like to go to, and we correlated that with the site. There are a number of uh, important improvements that are occurring in the area. The city shared these with us. We think that these will make a very big improvement uh, and it will likely help attract new retailers into the downtown area. And we think it will likely improve the commerce of many existing retailers. Uh, it's going to be a tough construction season. I don't know how long the construction will be. That will be a challenge for retailers. But once it's done and once it's open, we believe that these improvements will result in uh, stronger sales. It will attract more people here on a more regular basis. And it will probably extend your shopping area. By uh, 20, uh, this is a chart that's in our study, which breaks down, um, I don't know if you can see that. We, exam we examined 52 uh, retail categories, and this breaks down every category according to the amount of square footage that's supportable and the amount of sales that would be produced. For example, we found that 
There's not, and by 2015, by today, you can support 9,300 square feet of apparel stores. They will generate 2.6 million in sales or $285 a square foot per year. And all in all, uh, we found that by 2015, you can support, uh, this is just retail, 102,000 square feet of retail, growing to 108,000 by, 20, uh, by 2020. So if you're an existing business, you can use this chart. You can use our study to help target your customers. You can use it for expansion. Or if you're a property owner and you have places to rent, you can use this as a leasing tool to go out and attract new retailers. Or if you are a property owner and you want to build new space, you can use this as a leasing tool for building new space. This is the number of stores that are supportable. And uh, for the retail component, we found that you can support 29 to 40 additional stores by 2020. This is the, uh, re the restaurant category. We found that you can support a, uh, a tap room or a brew pub, probably two. You can support 8,800 square feet of full service restaurants, 14,000 square feet of limited service restaurants, special services of 3,500. So today you can support about 134,000 square feet of restaurants, and by 2020, five years from now, 143,000. We ran six models for our study, and this is the second most conservative model. We have models that show almost double of this. Uh, we thought that that would be a far a reach to, do, to say that publicly, but we found that this is a very strong market, that there are, uh, there are great opportunities for people to open businesses or expand their businesses in this area. We think there are a lot of people that are living in this area or visiting this area that aren't necessarily happy going to the shopping malls or going to the outlet center or going to uh, a conventional shopping center. They'd much rather go to a unique district. We found this same kind of study when we did Naples 20 years ago. Uh, we found a very big demand for restaurants on Fifth Avenue in Naples. At the time, if you remember 20 years ago, there were only three restaurants on Fifth Avenue in Naples. And the city didn't believe our study. We actually had to do the entire study over again because we found a demand for 35 restaurants on Fifth Avenue. And everybody told us at the time that in Naples, everybody eats at the country club or the yacht club and nobody would eat on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> And uh, so we did a study again, and we found even a stronger demand. We, uh, you know, and you have you can have a pent up demand that just isn't realized for non market reasons, and we think that's what's occurring here. For non market reasons, the historic village is generally underperforming. So this is by 2020. These are the categories that are supportable. about $50 million a year of additional retail sales, supporting about 144,000. Now, we're not necessarily recommending that the city expand this large. Our job isn't to do that. Our job is to just to tell you objectively what the market will bear. Uh, some cities, when they see these numbers, say we don't want any retail and they change the zoning to stop all development. Uh, other cities will say, well, we'd like a lot more, but our job is to give you an independent third party opinion of what's supportable. I was asked to discuss uh, a little bit about new trends in retail and uh, what retailers and restaurants are looking for and what the consumers are looking for. The retail industry is going completely urban. All of the regional and national retailers are right now looking for small towns to large cities to open new stores. They, they're following their customers. Customers like shopping on Main Street. Uh, this is my hometown, Birmingham, Michigan. And this is a small national chain. And it's one of many national chains and uh, regional stores that are opening in urban settings. This helps their brand. It helps them look like they're not a national chain. They don't want to be a national, they don't want to look like a national chain. And many customers prefer the convenience of being able to park really close to the store and to go in and out rather than to having to commit an hour or two to going to a regional mall. 
The key planning principles for retail are, first of all, don't build leasable space that you can't lease. Implement a historic character. If you're going to compete with the malls, you have to, you have to be historic and of uh, an authentic character. Uh, we'd like to see you seek 20% of the market share to be competitive. And we want you to provide the goods and services that are needed by your community. Those sound simple, but those are important elements to go after in your retail development strategy. Uh, many tourists, this is Nantucket off, the, off Cape Cod, the island of Nantucket. Many tourists right now high, like to go to uh, specialty re, uh, resorts that are small towns. And if you've been to Nantucket, it's very expensive. It has this uh, authentic Main Street, but many tourists will pay a lot of money to go there for a day or for a week or for the season because it has that walkable urban character. By the way, all of the shops on this street are owned by one shopping center developer. A real estate investment trust bought this in the 1930s and turned it around and it's actually operated and managed like a sophisticated shopping mall. The other challenge that we have with re as a retailer is that if this is your paycheck, only 4% of the paycheck goes for uh, buying apparel and only 5% of the paycheck is designated for dining out and for entertainment. 91% of the small family's paycheck is spent before they get it. And that's especially true with your seniors. Your seniors, many of them are on fixed incomes and they're very frugal when it comes to spending. Another challenge is that in the US, especially in Southwest Florida, we're over retailed. In the US, there's 20 square feet of retail per person compared to the other industrialized countries. Uh, in Southwest Florida, I've seen numbers as high as 200 square feet of retail per person. This area has a significant amount of over retailing, which is captured by your tourists and your snowbirds. The other thing is that as a small retailer, you have to come up with tricks to get people to go to your store. And uh, you, you want to come up with a reason for people to go to your store. This is a little a barber where my son goes to college in Scotland. And I noticed my son was coming back very well groomed when he, when he came back from home. And I found out why when, it, when I went over there. He was getting a haircut every week because he was getting a free shot of whiskey. But the small time retailer has to constantly outsmart the retailer. And that's what you'll have to do as a shopping district. You'll have to constantly come up with reasons for people to go there. This is a small store in Cape Cod. And this store got the city to paint the sidewalks to go directly to the front of their store. So when you cross the street and you look up, you're right at the entry to the store, and then you're gonna be tempted to go in there. They could have gone this way, but this store owner was very clever. And he got the city to paint them that way. I work around the country. We just finished a two-year assignment in South Memphis, Tennessee. It's a very poor area of 30,000 people, and this is their only grocery store, and this is their only restaurant and there's 30,000 people with very limited access to transportation, and our job was to find out what was supportable and then to help recruit businesses, and we were able to work out a deal with Kroger and a number of restaurants to come in to service this area. A lot of the restaurants right now and a lot of the retailers are seeking low to moderate income neighborhoods because that's where the growth potential is. And I noticed, for example, in your village, you have two dollar type stores. That's become very common to open new retailer in these districts. We just finished a year assignment in Southampton, New York, in the, in the Hamptons. And they called us in because they, in one summer, they developed 21 vacancies. They shot up to 35% vacancies in their town. And even though it's a, it's a postcard, perfect, walkable town, it has, even has the right benches, you know, it has beautiful streets, beautiful streetscape, what happened is, in one year, their library moved here, their post office moved outside of town, their grocery store moved outside of town, and a small department store left the downtown. And so in one year, they lost four anchors. And anchors are really important to have a competitive downtown. And so we like, for example, we love to have libraries downtown, because in this case, this library was too far away to walk, Nobody would cross the highway and nobody would walk through these parking lots to go shopping. 
And so uh, we love to see libraries. Libraries will bring on average 500 to 1,000 people per day to downtown, and they really do a lot, so much so that my new shopping center developers are putting libraries in their town centers. They're, they're actually paying for the property and they're contributing to the cost of the library. Uh, we work um, for a lot of new urban communities. I'm one of the original 20 new urbanists in the country. And we were called in to help Abacoa Town Center. It's in Jupiter, Florida, on the east side of the state. And this was built about 12 years ago and it's gone through four bankruptcies in 12 years. And our job was to help, uh, help work this out, to figure out what was the fatal flaw. In their case, uh, they had, when we got hired, they were about 50% vacant. A number of the stores still had dirt floors in them. And, um, and they just broke too many fundamental rules. The main rule they broke was that they were 80,000 square feet in size of unanchored space. And as a rule of thumb, you can't build more than 30,000 square feet of retail without an anchor. So this is a rule that a, uh, a lot of the new urban firms that we work for break. They try to build too much space without an anchor. And so we came up with a strategy to, to fix this. We found a space to bring an anchor. An anchor wanted to go there. And we came up with a lot of, a lot of little, little things to help them. For example, just signage would help here. This is a really nice restaurant, but they weren't allowed to have a sign advertising the restaurant. Walkability. Uh, there's something on your iPhone called a walk score. I don't know if you know about this device. And the walk score measures from w 1 to 100. They rate you for your walkability. And if you have a 100, then you have a lot of things to walk to. If you have a 1 or a 2 or a 3, then you have very few things to walk to. And they count things to walk to as restaurants, grocery stores, shops, schools, libraries, churches, things that you can walk to. The better retailers right now are looking to open new stores in villages that have walk scores of 70 or higher. And I didn't look up the walk score here, but you're, prob you're probably in the high 60s. You might be over 70. And this is the new buzzword, and it's because if you have a walk score of 70 or higher, your home sales tend to be higher, rental rates are higher, office rents are higher, residential rents are higher, and the cost of borrowing money, the cap rates are about 8% less. So there are many leading real estate developers right now that are flooding to cities that have a high walk score. It's where they want to invest. It costs less to borrow money, and it's where they like developing new housing and new retail. This is an example of a perfect walk score. This is a, a new town in Charlotte, North Carolina, called Burkdale Village. They have almost 100 walk score, and that's because these residents, when they go downstairs, they can walk to about 40 restaurants, and they can walk to a lot of shops, and they can walk to a lot of things. This is where a lot of empty nesters right now are flooding to. A lot of empty nesters are preferring to live here rather than a, gate, a gated community where they can go downstairs and they can walk to a Starbucks or to a nice restaurant. This also happens to be where a lot of millennials prefer to live right now. They prefer to live where uh, it's in a smaller unit, but where it's something that they can walk to. And so you see a lot of these walkable towns being built from scratch or from new. The, the challenge with building a new town is that if the retail underperforms, if you have shops that turn over a lot or they don't offer high quality goods and services, it spoils the residential above. So this is a new town in Virginia and nobody really wants to live on top of this shop. And so when you mix the two together, the retail controls the price of the other, of the other land uses. If the retail is good, uh, there's something, for example, called the Starbucks effect. If you have a Starbucks, people will pay 12 to 20% more to live within a five minute walk of a Starbucks. The same with Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. Uh, so if you have the right retailers, if you have a strong district, uh, you'll see a snowball. We saw this happen in Naples, Florida. When I did the study, uh, you could buy any house on 6th Avenue for $100,000. 
These were 100-foot lots. You know, 6th Avenue was nice, but it wasn't great 20 years ago. And because, in part because of the changes of 5th Avenue, uh, it had a very quick and positive impact on the surrounding houses. I think that's highly likely to happen here in your historic district in Bonita Springs. It feels very similar to me in many ways. This is the new town that we worked on in Michigan that uh, the retail never did well. They built beautiful houses, but the retail didn't do well and so it didn't have an immediate positive impact on the housing. There is a movement for the compact small neighborhood house. This is a community that we planned in Michigan. These are 40 foot lots and these were uh, sold very quickly uh, to empty nesters and uh, first time home buyers. And you have in immediately adjacent to your historic village, you have a neighborhood with this sort of lot, with this sort of potential. Uh, this is the product that a lot of people are looking for right now. They'll, they'll live on a small lot, they'll have less, they'll be willing to put up with less privacy if you can give them something to walk to. By 2030, it's forecast that there will be a demand in the U.S. for 15 million more attached homes, for 40 million more of these small lot homes, and by 2030, there's going to be a surplus. There will be a glut of 23 million large lot homes. And it's forecast that by 2030, in 15 years, the large lot home will deplate, will deflate in value on average in the U.S. by about 25 to 35 percent. This is the small lots or uh, the compact lots are what about half the home buyers are preferring. About half the home buyers don't like these lots. They prefer to live on large lot homes, but right now it's only at about 30 percent that prefer this. There's something called the X factor, which I think uh, Benita Springs is starting to achieve. And the X factor is when you have an emotional relationship between the built environment and the visitor. Most of the new towns that we work on, this is one we worked on in Ohio, don't really achieve the X factor as much as historic districts. This is a beautiful town. It's been extremely successful, but it takes a while to get the X factor. And you have the X factor when you have old time independent retailers. This is John Cross's son, for example, where you know the store owner, where you have a, you know, you have a friendly independent retailer, and where you have uh, things like this. This is in Nantucket. They have this wonderful old flower pot right in the middle of the intersection. You know, cars have to swerve out of the way to avoid it, but it helps create that X factor. Artists can help create the X factor, and we encourage you to work with the local art schools and to find local artists to come up with fun things like this for your shop front. There's something called art space. I don't know if you've heard of them or not, but it's a way to get artists to move into your community and uh, it helps create the X factor. This is a small town in northern Michigan, Harbor Springs, where it has that X factor. It has little houses have been turned into little shops and they're built to a very high standard. They've been restored to a very high standard and it's the kind of little place that people will go to, they'll spend a lot of money and they enjoy just hanging out there. Harbor Springs has the X factor. This little shop, for example, sells little jars of jelly for about 12 to $15 each. And you just feel like you're getting a great value when you go into that store because it has the X factor. Uh, this is over in uh, on the east coast of Florida, and uh, this has the X factor, this old-fashioned neon sign. We like old mid-century retro signs. They're illegal in a lot of places to develop. We'd recommend that you have a sign ordinance that allows neon and that allows some of this fun X factor, but it's hard to control. Uh, one thing that we've been doing is, is uh, we've been working with developers that will take uh, and build pop-up shops. This is a, a client of mine in Brooklyn that took shipping containers and opened the sides and turned them into these little shops. And I think there's a potential here for you to have these pop-up shops where you have people that are making products in their homes, they're, they're doing arts and crafts, 
but they don't want to sign a two or three or four year lease for a storefront, but they will be willing to sign it here. This is a little village in northern Michigan, Walloon Village, where we had a client buy the entire village that had been torn down and, and burned down. He bought the entire village, and our first phase was to create these little pop-up shops. So we built these little sheds. These have a northern Michigan design to them. They're white with red roofs, and they have that authentic northern Michigan character. And then these are little shops where we have artists come in and they sell home crafts. And it's a way of, of creating a destination. And I notice you have one uh, food truck um, in your village right now. A collection of food trucks could do the same thing. When we create places with the X factor, we would go to and find uh, in your region, we would find the authentic look that you have. This, is, of course, is a northern Michigan character but we would duplicate the character that you have in your region. One of the things we did in Walloon is that we went and took historic houses that were being torn down and bought them for a dollar and moved them into the village. This was a lakefront house that was going to be torn down. We moved it into the village and turned it into a shop. And if you know Seaside up in the Panhandle, that's what they did originally. Seaside went and bought shacks, turned them into restaurants and then the shops, and immediately gave that authentic X factor. These are the little shops we have up in Walloon. And now the second phase was an office, an office wanted to locate there. And the third phase is a restaurant. And the fourth phase, which just opened this spring, is a 32 room inn. These are little shacks that we found in northern Michigan that we're going to use for a pop up shops somewhere else. These were migrant workers' housing. Time is the new luxury for shoppers today. Um, this was our shopper in the 1970s and 1980s and 90s. She liked to go to the mall. She would spend about two or three hours per mall visit. And she would go to the mall two or th three times per month. Um, when she went to the mall, she got all dressed up. She put her heels on. She got her hair done. And uh, she would go to almost every store in the mall. Shopping used to be the number one social activity for many women 10 and 20 years ago. They love to shop. This is her daughter, uh, the shopper today. She doesn't like to shop, and shopping is now seen as a chore. It's something that she prefers not to do. She treats it just like having to clean the house or having to take the kids uh, to school. And uh, so she doesn't like to shop. When she shops, she's very busy. She tends to be a uh, in a two-income family, or, she's, or she may be a single parent, or she may be going to night school. And so shopping is done very quickly today, and it's done after 5 o'clock at night. Last year, 70% of all sales occurred after 5 o'clock at night and on Sundays in the United States. So if your shop closes at 6 o'clock at night, you're immediately giving up about 70% of the market share. This just shows how much uh, money our shopper used to spend per visit, and this is how much time she spent. This is how much money she's spending now, and that's how much time she's spending. The shopper today is spending more money in 20 minutes than her mother spent in two hours. She's going to her favorite store. She's shopping online. She's shopping with her iPad. She knows what she wants to buy before she gets into the store. And she stays very loyal to certain brands. She doesn't adventure shop anymore. Even the tourist doesn't adventure shop. They like to stay loyal to certain brands. Because of that, the shopping center industry invented the lifestyle center, like the Mercado, like Coconut Point. This was invented to give the feeling of a downtown, to give the character of an open air center, but uh, to have the shops that the brands and the shops at the retail that the shopper likes to go to. So you'll see town squares and lifestyle centers always have a main street. They always have some sort of town square and they always have on street parking. Small towns can function like a town center or like a lifestyle center in that they have shop fronts, they have streets, most of them have on street parking. And a small town can be competitive with a mall today by offering the convenience, by offering, uh, if you can offer better hours, and by offering the convenience. 
Uh, all of the new towns that we work on, this is one I did not work on, this is Victoria Gardens in California, but all the towns that we see always have the street and they always have on-street parking and we generally put in parallel parking on the main street because it looks better, it's less threatening to a diner, you don't want to sit at a table and have a car charging towards you. And uh, in our town centers, we even put in parking meters. You're probably not to a point where you need parking meters here. You may never be at that point. But in our new town centers, we always put in parking meters. That's the only way that we can stop employees from parking in front of the cars, in front of the stores. Men generally don't shop. Uh, men are not good shoppers. When they go to the shopping center, they tend to whine and complain. Uh, they tend to look at their watch a lot. Uh, we notice that very often men will stand outside of the store and stand guard and, and warn other men not to go into the store. <laughs> it's very common. Now, actually, men do shop, but they shop quite differently than women. Uh, men will uh, be willing to park a little further away. Uh, men uh, are not bothered by uneven surfaces as much. Teenagers don't, tend not to intimidate them as much. Once they're in a store, a man likes it when you lay everything out so they don't have to think about what goes with what. Uh, they love it when you put the shirt and tie and sweater and pants all on one hanger so they can just pick it up and run to the cash register and get out of the store before somebody sees them. That's their main concern. Uh, parking is probably the most misunderstood but most important part for a sustainable shopping district. Uh, we of course love on-street parking. We estimate that every stall with a, uh, that's metered, and I'm not sure you're ready for meters here, but we estimate that every stall with a meter uh, generally turns about 20 times per day. And if, it cars, if you get 20 shoppers per day per stall, each stall will generate about $150,000 a year in retail sales. So every stall generates about $150,000 per year which means every two stalls generate enough to support a small store. One store can support from the turnovers of this parking. This is a small town in northern Michigan called Petoskey. It's a town of 7,000 people. It's a, it's a very, uh, it swells to about 25,000 people in the summer. It's a strong tourist destination. And they fund a down, they have a downtown development authority and they fund the entire budget, 350,000 per year, with the revenue from the parking meters. So all of the parking meters here goes to fund the Downtown Development Authority, and the DDA spends that money on advertising. They run newspaper ads, cable ads, and they do, do fabulous uh, flowers and Christmas and holiday lighting. So the, the money is well spent. Uh, the small retailer, depends on people being able to park. And so if you don't have on-street parking, the small retailer has to have a small city lot nearby. And I would compliment the city for looking into building small lots and some on-street parking. But it's important that the shopper be able to get into the store and park. If they can't park nearby or directly in front of the store, many shoppers will not go around the block looking for a space two or three times. They will just continue on their way. If on the other hand, this space were open and you went by this frame shop and saw that there was something you might wanna buy there, if you can just pull over and park in front of the store and go on your way, um, you will do so. Unfortunately, we find that most shop owners park in front of their store all day long. It's just human nature. This is a little shop on Cape Cod. Here's the store manager's car and I vacationed there for two weeks this summer and that car was there every day for two weeks. So uh, every day, 22 potential customers, 20 potential customers couldn't park in front of that store. And uh, that is probably costing that store owner about 150 to $200,000 a year in retail sales. There's no known measure that we are aware of that will stop employees or store owners from parking in front of their store. It's just human nature, they just don't know better. I have, whole, I have a whole slideshow showing store owners standing in front of their cars, pointing at their shop, 
bragging that they got that space and they get it every day because they get there early. If you ever do install parking meters, we recommend that you go with the old fashioned meters that take quarters or credit cards. Don't go with the machines. These are very complicated to use. They're frustrating to shoppers. They take a lot of time to use. Sarasota, for example, installed them and removed all of them after six months. They were very frustrating for the Sarasota customer downtown. Uh, we prefer that you not have diagonal parking. Diagonal parking makes your street look like a parking lot rather than an urban street. And it's threatening to pedestrians to have cars charging towards them. It's also hard to cross the street. You have to zig and zag in and out of these cars. And you see the back side of the car. We prefer instead parallel parking. It's easier to cross the street. Uh, you don't see the grill or the tail part of the car. And it creates a very nice pedestrian safety zone on the sidewalk between the pedestrian and the um, street. This is a little city that called us in because they had a parking lot here that they removed and they're going to turn it into a park. And we estimated that the loss of the, this is their main street. We estimated the loss of these stalls would equate to about $2 million a year in lost retail sales. On-street retail generally requires on-street parking. You're not, your, your historic village is not quite a walkable district yet. It probably will be with the streetscape that you're installing and with the on-street parking. But many of your shop fronts are pulled back from the street and eventually we hope that those shop fronts can approach the street so that you can walk along and see storefronts, storefronts like this. Uh, I don't know, do you have a parade in your district yet? You do? Yeah. Great. That's a, sign, that's a sign that it's a place that's loved. We like to see small squares and parks. Uh, we like to see streets that are narrow. As a rule of thumb, we like to see the lanes be around 10 feet wide, 11 feet maybe at the maximum. If possible, we like to see medians and islands down the middle. Uh, it gives a refuge for the pedestrian that crosses the street. They don't need one here because the street is so narrow. Um, but if your street's a little wider than that, then we like to see that. Uh, signage is very important, and I don't know what your sign code is, but we recommend that you have a sign code that encourages very high standards of signs. We like to see projecting signs, but we like them to be four square feet or less. We like signs that are uh, solid pieces of wood or some man-made material. We don't like to see signs that are internally illuminated, that are pieces of plastic with, with uh, light inside of them. Uh, anchors are important. Um, historically, downtowns always had anchors. They had department stores. This is a five and dime store, a, or the same as a dollar store today. Uh, downtowns always had lots of traffic. They always had on-street parking. They usually had some sort of public transit. What's interesting is historically, downtowns didn't have street trees. It's nice to have street trees. I really support them. But historically, a lot of downtowns didn't have them. They had major anchors downtown. This is a major department store in Philadelphia called Wanamakers. And this is the size of 10 super Walmart stores, to put it in scale. I mean, downtowns had major department stores in their heyday. The department stores brought people downtown on a regular basis. And those uh, department stores then helped the small shops by bringing people in front of them. The largest retailers in the U.S. are big box retail. Uh, Walmart is the largest retail in the world, and it's the largest retailer in every category. And like Walmart or not, about half of Americans go to Walmart every week. 50% uh, of us go there every weekend, and about 80% of Americans go to Walmart at least once a quarter. Um, Walmart is the largest uh, retailer in the world in every category, paint, shoes, children's toys, groceries, shotguns, 
uh, you name it, diamonds. Most Americans buy their diamonds at Walmart. Uh, Walmart is the largest in every category. The basic economics uh, are that form follows anchor. The anchor uh, tends to pay low rent or no rent. In exchange for that, the inline shops, known as the gross leasable area, pays more rent. So if you have a neighborhood center, uh, Publix might pay half the rent of the inline tenants. And instead, instead of paying uh, rent, the grocery store will advertise and bring people to the center on a regular basis. It's hard to have more than 30,000 square feet of shops without an anchor. Uh, but if you have a strong anchor, like this is a Creighton Barrel in Cambridge, Massachusetts, this anchor brings home buyer, home uh, shoppers in front of these home stores. So these home stores benefit from the Creighton Barrel that bring people there. We're not concerned about having anchors that are too big. Um, in fact, I think bigger is better. As long as the anchor is up to the street, as long as it has a good urbanism and it has good glass, uh, I'm not wor worried whether it's a 10,000 square foot anchor or a 50,000 square foot anchor, as long as it has good urban design. The uh, anchors right now are coming into the United States, H&M, Uniglo, uh, all of these major international anchors are coming into American cities. They're going into old space, they're going into old department stores, and these are loved by millennials. If you want to get millennials, you have to have places that offer fresh design at a reasonable price. Uh, this is a $12 dress, for example. Uh, public markets make fabulous anchors. Public markets sell produce and fish and cheese and um, pre prepared foods and meats. And they're open six or seven days a week. And uh, you have little vendors. And uh, they are wonderful anchors in downtowns. This is one of my favorites. It's in Napa, California. It's called the Oxbow Market in Napa, California. And this, if you, had a, if you could get a public market, if you could attract a public market, there is USDA grants available. There are federal and state grants available to help support them. And this would become one of the major tourist attractions for Southwest Florida. It would, be a, it would really help commerce. This is an anchor that we just uh, helped refurbish in Charleston, South Carolina, called the Charleston City Market. Uh, we had them add natural lighting and skylighting in the anchor in the uh, market because natural lighting uh, increases retail sales by about 10 to 12 percent. Uh, this is a larger city, of course, Pasadena, California, but it just shows how the, the large retailers are loving to go to historic downtowns. They will go to small places. They like to go to historic houses. And um, they like to go to historic shops. The average uh, shopping mall in the US is about 1,000 feet long from front to front of department store. Your shopping district is longer than 1,000 feet. So what we do in that case is we divide it up into smaller segments that are about 1,000 1, feet each. And then where these segments overlap, we try to recruit anchors to go there. So your, uh, your street is too long to be one shopping district. You probably should break it down into smaller segments. The large format retailers right now are doing what they call the anchor wrap where they're taking the big box and they're hiding it with small shops. They're putting these small shops all the way around the outside. This is the new model for a Home Depot. Target has what they call a city Target store. It's half size and they're building them in downtowns and they are finding as many, down, as many downtowns, larger than yours, but as many downtowns as they can to open these city Targets. This is a new concept for Walmart. This opened recently in downtown Washington, D.C. It's a three-story Walmart store attached to a historic building with a street front. And Walmart has a series of retailers that are, some of them are quite small, and Walmart has an expansion um, concept of going into small towns and cities again. Market share. Uh, most downtowns right now have 2% market share. 
your market share is probably two tenths of one percent in your historic district. Lifestyle centers like Mercado have seven percent market share. The internet has nine percent. Regional malls, 31, and power centers, 37 percent. Uh, retailers right now, when they open new stores, they like to go to these blue counties. This is where 50 percent of Americans live, in one of these blue counties. And would that be you? Is that you right there? So our market analysis said that uh, by, well, actually no. Uh, visual merchandising is a way that retailers uh, use to get you to come into the store and to spend more money than you might want to. They have all of these tricks. This is one called the eight second rule where it takes eight seconds to walk past the normal storefront. You get to the storefront within four seconds, and that means the merchandise, the window display, has to motivate you to turn within about a second and a half. You see something for a second and a half, two seconds, you get to the storefront within four seconds. If the door is open, uh, the retailer will have three times as many people in the store than if the door is closed, even in hot climates. Once you're in the store, retailers like this is called the front and center table. You probably see this. They put a table right in the front and right in the center of the store. That brings people from the outside into the store. And retailers like to use their, this color red. There's something about this color of red that causes a chain, a chemical reaction in your brain which causes you to want to buy merchandise. So you'll see this color of red everywhere. Uh, even McDonald's and Arby's uses this color red, but this, it, it, people equate this with the holidays and they get motivated to go shopping. The stores themselves are laid out in a, a pattern to get the shopper to turn right. Nine out of ten of Americans turn right when they go into a store, and then they walk in a counterclockwise motion. And if this is the cash register, they try to get them to go past the merchandise in the middle twice. We work with a lot of independent retailers, helping them with their uh, storefronts. This is a guy we helped in Baltimore. His name was Andy. Um, Andy was going out of business because the city wouldn't let him have any more open signs. <laughs> he was blaming the city planner for being unreasonable. Uh, we found that uh, Andy had other challenges. Uh, for example, he closed his blinds at 1 o'clock in the afternoon and his customers stopped coming in at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And he never made the connection between closing his blinds and people stopping coming into a store. Uh, the other problem was that the city had on-street parking here, and the city was removing the on-street parking to make the sidewalk wider. And Andy and his neighbor retailers were concerned that without on-street parking, he wouldn't do very well. Um, we found Andy had these other problems with his store. He had dirty glass, the front door was unpainted, and the front door would, would actually fall on you when you opened it, it was unhinged. He had duct tape holding up his glass, he had a dead mouse in his window, and he had dead flowers, and he had these st chairs stacked in the corner which made it look like he was closed. So Andy had all of these challenges with his store. We fixed, we fixed them. We, um, we found that he had this Pepsi machine, a cooler, in the window, and it would overheat in the afternoon. That's why he closed his blinds. The sun would cause the machine to overheat. So we helped him move the machine to the back of the store. We um, cleaned the windows for him. We pl planted fresh flowers. We spent about $150 on Andy's store, and we were able to triple the sales. Can you tell what Andy sells? Any guesses? He's a, he's a deli operator. <laughs> he's a deli operator. So we, uh, we pulled out the oldest trick in the book. If you're a deli operator, if you sell food, uh, you have to have a clean window. You have to have a clean store. But also you have to have people eating in your restaurant. If it's the best advertisement. If you, have some, if you can see other people eating in the restaurant, you'll be more likely to go into the restaurant. So we put some French tables out in the front and some tables inside the restaurant. 
and uh, we told them to sit the most attractive people in the window, uh, which is an old restaurant trick. You sit the beautiful people up front. The less beautiful people, you kind of hide in the back where nobody can see them. So you can guess where, where I sit all the time. And uh, Andy tripled the sales for about $150. The small retailers that we all love need to understand basic retailing, basic, basic merchandising. One of the old tricks is to paint the back wall a bright color. If you just paint the back wall a bright color, people will be more likely to walk to the back of the store. It's nice to have interesting store windows to stop traffic. It's nice to have a lot of glass. Uh, we recommend that you have at least 70% glass. And uh, if you have a sun issue, you can use awnings or you can put in a shade during the afternoon when you have sun in your window. And we recommend that the glass be clear. I've seen studies that indicate that if you have a clear window, that you can have twice to triple the sales per square foot than if you have a dark tented window. Every shopping center has a different philosophy about how to design the center. I'll give you a test. Which mall has the highest sales per square foot in the country? And which mall recently closed and went out of business? Mall B has the philosophy of making everything beautiful. Beautiful pavers, beautiful railings, beautiful light fixtures, beautiful plants. Mall A made everything very plain. They only put color on the merchandise in the storefront. Everything else was vanilla. Even the railings were clear so that you could see from here, so that you could see that storefront. The ceilings were plain. And Mall B recently closed and went bankrupt. And Mall A is the highest grossing center in the country. It's, Mall A is a pure selling machine. I used to work for this developer of Mall A. And, uh, we noticed that people walked counterclockwise. They walked four feet per second. We did everything very carefully to give the shopper what they wanted in the mall. We didn't even put clocks in our malls because when we did, people would go home around 4.30 in the afternoon. The uh, average shopping center in the U.S. has sales of $275 a square foot per year. If you're a small retailer, uh, you want to have, you should be trying to have sales of over $250 a square foot per year. The average independent retailer has sales of only $80 a square foot. And the, the mall on the left that I showed has sales of, their average is almost 1,000 a square foot per year. This is a square foot per year. These are the sales per square foot of grocery stores. Is Publix in there? No. No, Publix would be high. Publix would be on, on the right-hand side. It would be very high. But Trader Joe's has sales of $2,000 a square foot per year on average. Apple, the computer store Apple, has sales of $5,000 a square foot per year. Merchandising plans, we recommend ideally you have a merchandising strategy. This is the merchandising strategy I developed for Naples for Fifth Avenue where we located anchors and we located various types of retailers. Now, in a downtown, you can never have a pure merchandising strategy because you have lots of property owners. But at least there's an overall strategy of what they wanted to shoot for. And so the, the, they have a business district, uh, a business association, and the business association is working towards this. This is a strategy we did. Uh, urban design is important. Um, we would warn you not to put crepe myrtles in front of stores. And I, I haven't seen your plan in detail, but it, we love crepe myrtles, we love street trees, but we would prefer they be located to the side where they don't block storefronts. Uh, this is an example in uh, where in this new town center they put trees in front of every storefront. This is Worth Avenue in Palm Beach. And they have uh, palm trees dead in front of a lot of the storefronts. We like street trees. I'm glad you're installing tree trees, street trees. It'll make it more walkable. It's just they have to be located with care. This is Worth Avenue, you know, one of the great shopping districts, of course, in the country. This is their streetscape. 
They spent, uh, I don't know how much, but they spent a lot of money on their streetscape three or four years ago and saw a very sharp increase in people walking downtown and in the sales. Uh, awnings are important. We like to see awnings uh, that, are, that don't have a side on them. They provide a little more light and ventilation to the building and they give it a fresher, cleaner look. Uh, we like to see downtowns that are well maintained and they have lots of flowers and that are attractive to look at. If your downtown looks like this and yours doesn't, uh, it tells the shoppers that they're paying too much and they're, they're being overcharged for what they buy. Signage is extremely important. I don't know your sign code, but I recommend that you require letters that are pinned on to the front of the building and that you allow dimensional signage like this. In fact, we allow these signs to be larger if they're sculptural. We like to see handcrafted signs. Tourists love this. So we like the A-frame signs, but we think they should be handcrafted. And the signs should be high quality. Tourism. Uh, tourist, uh, shoppers love, tourists love to shop. Uh, we do a lot of research in Orlando for a lot of the theme parks up there. And the number one thing tourists do now when they go to Florida with their time is shop. And they love to go to places that look like this. You have the potential to look this way, uh, to be interesting, to be in a nice destination. And you don't want to look like this. Tourists hate to go to places like this. This is why they left their home to go on vacation. Tourists, believe it or not, like to buy the same brands on vacation that they buy at home. This is a surprise to all of us, but if you're a Talbot's customer, uh, you would like to shop and still buy that Talbot's apparel while on vacation, but they prefer to buy it in a unique setting. They prefer to buy it in a historic house or in a walkable town center. Uh, tourists love public markets. We recommend that you offer the wants and needs of your customers. This is Charleston. We've been doing a market study for Char we've been doing consulting for Charleston on and off for 20 years. This is the Mayor Riley. Charleston has a trade area of over 300 miles. And people will drive past all these other towns to go to Charleston because once they're there, they're rewarded with a very walkable main street. They get the brands that they like and they get these high quality buildings. And I would really encourage you to have high building standards, to require good signage, to require lots of glass, to require uh, beautiful buildings. Uh, that's what tourists are looking for today. And um, it'll translate to higher sales in a more sustainable district. I just worked with a small town in, in Tennessee and they had just wiped out all of their building standards and said, we're going to attract a lot of retailers by having no standards. And I had to point out to them that the better retailers will only go to cities that have high standards because they're going to spend a lot of money on their storefront and they want other people to do it too. So this was our analysis for Bonita Springs. We found that today you can support 134,000 square feet of additional space generating 42 million in sales and by 2020 it's going to grow up to almost 50 million and almost 145,000 square feet. It's, you are in the middle of an extremely desirable market. The market potential is here and um, I would encourage you to um, build to a high standard so that you can I think realize that potential. So we're the Gibbs Planning Group. We have an institute, the Urban Retail Institute. We post on our Facebook page daily our, our research about uh, urban retail. If you want to follow us, there's no charge, of course. It's called the Urban Retail Institute, and the research that we, uh, that we find we post daily. I teach a class at Harvard, which is open to the public if you like to go in the summer. And I published a book called Urban Retail which uh, I've tried to describe in the last uh, 35, 40 minutes. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to take some questions. Good job, thank good you. job. We, uh, we do have some times for, uh, for some questions. First off, I want to let you know that 
Bob's um, full report is online uh, at the city site, so if you want to take a look at it, you're welcome to do that. If you have any questions, um, rather than try to pass a microphone, um, if we can impose upon Bob, if you have a question, if you'll just stand up and state it loudly so he can hear, he will repeat the question into the microphone, and then he will answer that. Okay? Is that all right? Thanks, Great. Carl. Questions? Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that work? Because I think some of our standards kind of encourage that over the retail to get a, a, a second mm -hmm. story level street shape, but what about the market aspect of that? The, the question is about the markability of having office on top of retail. We're finding that office and retail work really well together. We like to see a lot of office because it fills the restaurants during the mid-time when they're usually slow. And the office workers like to work in walkable districts where they can go downstairs and go to shops, like that little village in Michigan called Walloon Village. Uh, that was the first building they built, was an office. And they found all of these people that wanted to work in the village where they could go to these restaurants and shops. They work very well together. Anybody else? Where do you put the parking for the office workers? The, where, the question is, where do you put the parking for the office workers? And fortunately, the retailers' need for parking is less in the daytime. It's more busy on the weekends and the evenings. So you can share the parking with the office because the office peaks during the weekday. The retailers peak on the weekends and nights. So there's room for that. And plus, the office workers, except for the boss, the office workers will generally be willing to walk a block or two. They don't have to park right next to the shop. So we like to provide some parking for the manager and for the boss, and then have the employees walk a block or two away if necessary. Um, I don't have it. Uh, does your study include um, areas that are trash and anchored? Because unlike um, the places you showed, they're all anchored by department stores. Mm -hmm. Our downtown district where you're talking about has got many attractions. Mm -hmm. And they attract from worldwide. And the demographics are much mm -hmm. different. And I, I just was wondering if the study covered that. Um, something yes. like Williamsburg or uh, mm -hmm. like Disney World mm -hmm. City um, and uh, Universal City. Uh, mm -hmm. Those kind of places are uh, more attraction oriented right. and um, have that base. And, and this just kind of brings us to the Christmas point. No, well, first of all, it would be a mistake to turn yourself into a shopping center. Your advantage is that you're a collection of unique, one-of-a-kind stores. And I think if you, be, if you mall, if you turned into a mall, that would be a mistake. Even if you looked perfectly charming, which you do. The question is, though, what can you have as an anchor besides a department store? Because you're not going to get a department store. And you, can, your, you have some anchors right now. You have some parks. You have some beautiful parks along your riverfront and other areas which serve as an anchor. You have um, some restaurants that serve as an anchor. You can have a collection of restaurants. You can have a civic use, like if you could have a library, for example. That could be an excellent anchor. So you don't have to necessarily have a department store. You won't get one. But you can have non-retail anchors, like parks, community uses, um, restaurants, things to walk to. And just having a walkable district in itself can be an anchor, where people can just come here and say, let's, it's, it's cooler tonight, let's just come and let's walk around in Bonita Springs, get an ice cream cone or yogurt or something like that. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. The question is, what kind of marketing strategy would you adopt? I, I think there should be a mark. First of all, there should be a marketing strategy. There should be some promotion, and that can be funded. It's usually not funded by the city. It's usually funded by a business association, and hopefully you can start a business association, and they can start funding marketing campaigns for the downtown. Um, some cities will hire a business recruitment person 
where they will go out and recruit people to come into the downtown, or sometimes businesses will do that. Some downtowns will form a business improvement district, a BID, and the BID uh, assesses the property owners, and then all of that assessment goes towards advertising and promoting the downtown. But there probably should be some level of advertising and promotion. Right now, I have the feeling that every business is doing its own promotion, which is hard. Every business has to fight for it, fight hard to get one customer to come to their store. And it would be nice if you could work as a district, as a destination district, where you advertise to get people to come here. And once your new streetscape is done, uh, I think people will want to come here. You may want to have like a re-grand opening or something once it's all done and promote it and say, welcome to the new old Bonita Springs or something. I'm not a marketing guy, but come up with some strategy. Yes. Okay, uh, what's the ideal width of sidewalks? It depends on the scale of the community. A community of your size should have sidewalks somewhere between eight and 10 or 12 feet wide. Uh, if you approach 15 to 20 feet wide, they're out of scale. Those are for big cities. So I like to see sidewalks somewhere around eight to 10 or 12 feet wide. Sometimes we do asymmetrical sidewalks where we'll take the shady side. You don't have a shady side, You're, you go north south, don't you? But if we have a, a better side, we'll make that side a little wider. Sometimes it's nice to do asymmetrical walks though, so that one side is more accommodates restaurants than the other. Um, if your sidewalk is too narrow for a restaurant and you have a restaurant that wants to go there, um, in a lot of cities now they will rent a parking space for a platform and have the restaurant rent the space and make it an outside, outside dining right in the parking platform. We do that in my hometown. We have 15 restaurants that do that. It's really nice. Thank you. Yes? Uh, if you have access to rail uh, areas, would you recommend either a rail service in a close to a downtown area within a block or so? Y yes. If you have access to rail, we, we really recommend that, that you have some sort of rail system like the the one that just opened in Orlando called the SunRail system. We're working in Longwood right now at one of their SunRail stations, and we just finished a study for the um, Florida Hospital at another study, at another station. Yeah, if you can do that, it's great to have. Yeah, right. It does. Maybe someday that'll be a, a rail. It would be great if you, if you could do that, if you could establish a rail a uh, commuter rail. Don't give up the right of way. Yes. Well, I have about 200 questions, so okay. I'll try to limit it to just two. One, what's your general impression if you're trying to create a destination district to have something that pulls that together, such as a welcome center or you know, someplace someone can go and branch out from? You know, information mm -hmm. center. Okay, the first question is, how do you have an information center or a, a welcoming type center in the downtown? That's a really good idea if you could have one here. You, there, are, there are hundreds of thousands of tourists that come here that I think are going to stumble into Benita Springs and that would like to have a place to go to say, you are here, here's the restaurants, here's the shops, here's the attractions. So if you can fund that somehow, that would be great to do. Uh, and regarding how, how do you how do you respond to various ethnic 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 yeah, yeah. can't say it, ethnic groups uh, in your downtown? It's been a long day. Um, I, I think the best way is to offer the goods and services that appeal to a broad range of people. You know, not just all high-end shops, not just all dollar stores, and I'm not against either one of those, but offer goods and services that appeal to everybody so that everybody can go there and have, uh, have a, uh, ice cream or a cup of coffee or can uh, go shopping. Now, you don't, not every store will appeal to every income group and every, every demographic group, but it's nice to have a little bit of everything in your downtown. By the way, uh, that's my email, rgibbs at Gibbs Planning, and you are more than welcome to email me anytime. 
And if you just give me a few days to respond, I will, I will, should be able to respond to any questions. And I'll, I'll copy Carl when I do that. But uh, I'm more than happy to respond to your questions as, as well as I can. So you're, everybody's welcome to email me. There's, hey, Bob, you got some questions? Yes, uh huh. I'm very concerned with signage. I have a mm -hmm. project going on now mm -hmm. that we're working on. And I, I've been working at this business since 1969. Mm -hmm. Every town is afraid mm -hmm. that signs make it look junky. But mm -hmm. signage is the most probably the most important thing in the shopping mm -hmm. district. Have you made any direct uh, comments to the city on what they should have for signage? I, I know in Newport, Rhode Island, when we did Newport, Rhode Island after the Navy bases closed, it was a nightmare because you had stores behind stores. And we, you, we not only used individual signage, but gang signage out in front. Mm -hmm. and, and you had to in order to support mm -hmm. the retailers. Mm -hmm. And what we found that was really nice is those people on the gang side is we actually got them to advertise as a group in, in like, yeah. you know, Blackhawk Center yeah. and so on. And I'm just wondering how, how we're going to work with signage that will support the local business. That, that, that is an excellent, the question is about signage and he's concerned about, uh, about signage. Signage is essential for commerce. You can't have a store if nobody can find you. Now, uh, and we, he talked about what are known as gang, si gang signs or cluster signs. They have those in Winter Park, for example, and on uh, Park Street, Park Avenue in Winter Park. They'll have a sign on a pole and it'll list all of the retailers with an arrow saying this direction or this direction. And in a lot of cities, they actually charge for that um, or the business association charges for it. But it's really helpful for the visitor to be able to stop at a place saying you are here, here's where all the businesses are. And it's important for retailers to have signage. We like to see retailers have signage, of course, along the front and a projecting sign hanging out over the sidewalk. But we think the signs should be in good taste and modest. We generally like to, and by the way, I didn't look at the city sign code um, we could do that, but we didn't look at it. But I would just, I could give you cities to look at that have great sign codes. But we generally say uh, that you should be permitted one square foot of signage per one lineal foot of building front. So if you had a 20 foot uh, building front, we'd just say 20 square feet of signage uh, in a walkable district. But the signs should be good. There should be letters should be pinned on to the front. They shouldn't be inside a, a light box or something like that. Signage is important, especially in a, in a desirable place like yours. Yes? Have you looked at the green bin stamps? You know, here, retailers want to be on the US 41. That's the door you get the demographics. Mm -hmm. So you look at the top on 41 for green bins. Mm -hmm. So your nationals and your regionals are all going to be on. The, the question is, where do you, do, do you have or where do you get the demographics to support 140,000 square feet of retail? The demographics are here. Conservatively, you have the people living by here, living in the trade area, or working in the trade area to support it. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen just because you have the market. You're going to have to get people here. You're going to have to get people that are going to the big shopping centers off of uh, Highway 41 to come here. But we also know that Highway 41 Tamiami gets highly congested in season. And we think there are a lot of local people here that avoid it because it, it takes forever to go anywhere. And we think that there's a chance for you to grab some local commerce. That's why we like to see you have local retailers. You're not going to get very many. You may get a regional or two chains here. You're not going to get national chains here. That may happen eventually, by the way. But. Um, for the next five years, I think the, your key is to have quality, local, independent retailers, and they're out there. You would have to go out and find them, but within 25 miles of here, or 30 miles of here, there's thousands and thousands of retailers and restaurants that would like to expand, but they probably don't even know about you. I think they're out there. What's, before I do that, anyone over here? Yes. Yeah. Hey, uh, the, the Napa Valley, that was that public-private partnership, or, or, or how was 
that, how did that come about? The, the question is about the Oxbow market in Napa. Uh, how did that come about? And I actually don't know how that came about. I think it's all private. Most of the markets that we see are public and private. There's one in Columbus, Ohio called the North Market, which is public and private. But there's lots of funding out there, and, and you, uh, you have the demographics to support that type of market. It's a great it, anchor, huh? It would be a wonderful anchor. I mean, it would be a wonderful, wonderful anchor to have here. It would, it would be a must-see for everybody coming to Southwest Florida. They would come here. Yes. Not, I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not following that. The city should be doing what? Well, I don't. The yeah. The question is, where should the city be now, given the fact that they're about to break ground on the new streetscape? Should they be going after grants and and being ready for this next step? I don't know enough to comment on that, but I do have a feeling, and I've seen this in other cities, that once the streetscape's done, uh, that you will, you will be found by many investors that will want to come here and invest in this community. I have a feeling that's going to happen here because you have the pent-up, there is a pent-up demand for new business to come here. I think it'll happen, but I don't know what the next step should be. I probably should, but I don't, that's beyond what we... I've been asked to do. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. The parking ratio, I think in your book you still are saying four per thousand. So is that what you see with the mix of uses here? I mean, so if you've got 144,000 square feet, you're talking four or five hundred spaces. Actually, that's a good question. Um, what's the part? What's the ideal parking ratio for a mix like this? We find that the best walkable small towns. Um, have about 2.75 to three cars per thousand. And that when you get, when you get around four per thousand, it becomes unwalkable. And one of the challenges that Bonita Springs has with walkability is that everybody has its own parking lot. Almost every store has its own parking lot. So it's, it's easier to drive between stores than walk between stores here. So, you're probably around 2.75. The best communities have a ratio of about 2.75 cars per thousand. If you bring in, it depends. If you bring in office, then you could even go maybe a little less. And I don't know what your ratio is. That's, that'd be a good question. What's your parking ratio now? You're probably around four right now, four per thousand. Anybody else? Well, please uh, feel free to email me if you have questions or join our Facebook group. Urban Retail Institute Facebook, and thank you. Well done. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate it.